here for the Middle East Institute Foundation for Middle East Peace uh, session today. You are in the right place. We're just going to leave this open for a little bit and let people enter the Zoom room. So just be patient and we'll be getting started very shortly. So Helen, I think maybe we should get started. I want to respect everybody's time. People can join if they come in late. We'll we'll catch them up. Great. Um, thanks. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, our first session in our eight part series um, uh, entitled "Israel Palestine: Where We Are, What Comes Next, and Why It Matters to Congress." My name is Khaled El Gindi. I'm the director of the uh, Middle East Institute's program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs. And I'm very pleased this morning to be co hosting this series uh, with my friend and colleague, Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Thanks, Khaled. And thanks to everyone who's joining us. Uh, today's session, as Khaled said, is, is entitled Israel and Palestine Why It Matters to Congress. So to dig into this question, we are very happy to be bringing you an outstanding panel of experts. Um, and I'm gonna introduce them very briefly here in alphabetical order. Um, starting with my friend Salem Barahme from the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy, PIPD, who is speaking to us from Ramallah. We then have uh, Zaha Hassan, who is a human rights lawyer and visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in Washington. And third, we have uh, Shibli Talhami, who is a non-resident senior fellow with the Center for Middle East Peace in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. And he is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland. For more about our guests, we'll be putting links uh, to their full bios and website and Twitter handles in the chat box. And also keep an eye on the chat box for links to relevant articles and other resources relevant to today's discussion. Um, and if you miss anything that we do put in the chat box, don't worry, we're going to be putting all these materials on the web page where you registered uh, for this uh, event, so you can find all of that and more. Uh, so the format this morning uh, and for the for our whole series is going to be a moderated Q&A uh, led by Lara and me. Uh, we'll put some basic questions to get the conversation started uh, to uh, uh, our panelists. Uh, but we very much welcome your questions as well uh, for our panelists. You can submit questions using the Q&A function uh, uh, located at the bottom of the uh, Zoom window. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. Lara and I will keep an eye on those, uh, as will our panelists. And uh, we'll try to incorporate uh, as many of them as we can. Uh, finally, um, this, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, and also, if you have any technical problems or questions about the webinar, please put those in the chat box rather than uh, in the Q&A. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Great. So I'm going to start us off, and I want to first go to Salem in Ramallah. So Salem, can you talk to us as a Palestinian living and working in Palestine and as a Palestinian who has spent a great deal of time engaging Americans at the grassroots level and also at the level of policymakers, including in Congress, why the role of Congress is important in the Israel-Palestine conflict and how the decisions made in this body affect the everyday lives of people on the ground in Israel-Palestine. Thanks, Lara, and uh, thank you and Khaled uh, for having me with with amazing uh, panelists uh, uh, Zaha and Shibli. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I, one thing, as a, as a young Palestinian, I often lament is that parliaments and legislators around the world have a, an outdo influence over the tra 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 trajectory of our lives. Um, you know, uh, whether it's financial, whether it's political, whether it's diplomatic, it really governs our daily realities. And nowhere is that the truth more than Washington, D.C. 
and Congress. Um, there are two examples where legislation or lack thereof really impact me and, and everyone I know uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis. One is the $3.8 billion uh, dollars the US uh, gives to Israel military funding. And for, 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 for many, it's seen as security assistance, but what does it mean to us and how does it affect us? Every, every Palestinian parent has to have a conversation with their child about how to cross the checkpoint. Going to school every day, I had to cross two. I had to go uh, one uh, leaving Jericho and one entering Jerusalem. And there is always the fear that an Israeli soldier who sees me as a child as a security threat might, might shoot or, or kill me. Um, and this is the same feeling I have as an adult today when I have to cross these checkpoints to go to work. Uh, one case uh, of, 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 of such a thing happened this summer, right around when George Floyd was killed in the US. I don't know if many are aware of this case, but there was a Palestinian young man around the same age as I am um, who had autism. His name was Yad al And he was on his way to his special needs school in Jerusalem when he was racially profiled by Israeli soldiers. And they pursued him thinking he had a weapon when he just had a phone. And uh, Iyad cowered near a dumpster and uh, they shot him, uh, you know, in cold blood uh, from close by, even though his caretaker was yelling at the soldiers that he had autism. And this is a very disturbing case, but it's, it's one of thousands where the Israeli military uh, takes Palestinian lives with impunity and there's never any form of justice or accountability for those people. Uh, also, I mean, you know, some of the, the other disturbing things is the arrest of children. You know, Israeli, Israeli, Israeli military doesn't just arrest children on the spot. They have this policy of arresting Palestinians in their beds at 3 a.m. And this happens on a nightly basis. They enter your home, they take you, they've taken child as, children as old as, as five or six or seven to jail and, and put them in administrative detention without uh, a, 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 a due process. Um, and, and up to or can be extended up to six months at a time. We live under a military occupation. The absolute supreme authority over my life is the Israeli military of defense and the Israeli, Israeli army. They can decide to take my body whenever they want without any form of accountability. And the 3.8 billion that comes from the US uh, every year helps fuel that uh, form of oppression. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a U.S. law uh, from 1961, the Foreign Assistance Act, that says any, any money consisted, that is consistent pound of gross uh, human rights violation must, must be, um, you know, must be halted or conditioned, and, and that's never been the case. The other um, issue I, I see is that of uh, US, U.S. nonprofits getting tax exemptions for money they send to Israeli settlements. I mean, Jared Kushner and uh, the former American ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, were, were guilty of that. They send money to Israeli settlements that have taken our land, annexed it, uh, and, and basically have taken up the majority of the West Bank and, and also the area surrounding Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. Um, so far, I mean, in, in, a, in a period of four years, you had American nonprofits send about 220, uh, 220 million to these settlements, which are an illegal under international law and considered a war crime, right? I look outside my window now at Ramallah and I see two settlements. These settlements take 83% of my water. I have two days of running uh, water a, a week. The rest of it I have to judiciously use in a water tank. These settlements on the hill next door get seven days of running water a week. Um, and that's just one of the ways that there's a, a deep system of discrimination built through these settlements. Um, the other is if under Israeli military law, it's illegal for me to politically protest or organize in any way, right? So if I wrote a Facebook status tonight, criticizing Israeli policy or oppression, the Israeli military would show up at my house at 3 a.m. and arrest me and take me to military co court where I'm tried by military judges, and there's a 99.9 .9 chance percent that I will be convicted without even knowing the charges. The Israeli settler across the, across the road, across the hill, can commit a violent crime, but they're tried in Israeli civilian court, and there's almost a 0% chance of them being convicted. 
So th these are some of the ways US Congress, either through legislation or lack thereof, affects the lives of millions of Palestinians that live under Israeli oppression. And it's the, it's the lack of accountability that has allowed a lot of that to go on. Uh, thanks, uh, Salem. Uh, I wanted to turn to Zaha. Uh, as someone who uh, follows Congress uh, quite closely uh, and uh, its role in Israel and Palestine in particular, can you give us a sense of uh, why Congress matters um, on this particular issue um, in comparison to the executive branch, uh, in comparison to other foreign policy issues, uh, does, does Congress have a unique role when it comes to Israel and Palestine? Thanks, Khaled, and thanks um, to uh, you and Lara and um, the Foundation for Middle East Peace and Middle East Institute for, for having us. I'm really pleased to be with Salem and um, Shibley and you too. Now, of course, it, it is the executive branch that has the foreign affairs powers under the US Constitution, but Congress controls the purse strings and can condition or cut off aid in ways that can tie a president's hand. Congress can also set the discourse around a foreign policy issue that can impact the kinds of actions the president feels politically comfortable to take. So if, if we take a look at some of the key moments in the history of the US-Palestinian bilateral relationship, we see how Congress has interjected itself legislatively in an attempt to steer the relationship in a certain direction. So like, for example, when secret talks were going on between the Reagan administration and the PLO in 1985, it was then that Congress passed a law attempting to restrict executive branch officials from negotiating with the PLO unless the PLO met certain conditions, including recognizing Israel's right to exist and ending violence. And in 1987, when the nonviolent grassroots Palestinian uprising was taking place against Israeli occupation, that garnered uh, you know, international solidarity and was a PR nightmare for Israel, it was precisely then that Congress passed a law finding the PLO to be a terrorist organization and prohibiting PLO operations in the US. This is still on the books as good law and what makes the PLO mission unable to operate in the US unless it obtains a waiver. Congress has allowed for these waivers it's starting when the Oslo peace process um, came online. And just as the Oslo peace process was starting and issues such as the status of Jerusalem were going to be negotiated between Israelis and Palestinians, Congress passed the Jerusalem Embassy Act, which called for the relocation of the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And uh, another example uh, is where Congress, um, you know, got in front of things was um, uh, when the Palestinian legislative elections were taking place in 2006, which were really pushed by the George W. Bush administration. Um, those elections were hailed as free and fair and a model for the Middle East by international observers, but it brought Hamas to power and resulted in Congress passing legislation barring economic assistance to any Palestinian government that included Hamas. So this pattern goes on and on and we see it today um, in how precisely at the moment when there's growing recognition among legal scholars, UN bodies, and now the most respected Israeli human rights organization saying that Israel's regime over Palestinians is one of apartheid, we find members of Congress attempting to define anti-Semitism to include legitimate criticism of Israeli policies. So with U.S. policy towards Israel-Palestine increasingly becoming a partisan issue, Congress may have a harder time uh, passing some of these kinds of, um, uh, you know, laws. We've seen in the past that that um, they really hamstring the executive branch from being more nimble in dealing with the human rights situation in Israel-Palestine and in Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. Of course, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing depends on who is in the White House and how they choose to exercise their foreign affairs powers in the context of Israel-Palestine peace. Thanks, Zaha. That, that's terrific for laying the groundwork for a lot of the rest of this discussion, I think, as well. Shibli, I want to turn to you as one of the preeminent experts on U.S. policy in the Middle East across the board and on Israel-Palestine. 
And, and maybe this is sort of a scene setter, but can you talk about how you would define US interests in this conflict? Um, you know, we've had previous administrations talk about resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict as a, quote, vital security interest. I think that was in the Obama era and even some of its predecessors. And of course, in the Trump era, this was treated as a marginal issue that would sort of resolve itself on the backs of, of, of normalization agreements in the region. And, and based on how you answer that question, can you also talk a little bit about what that means for Congress's role in, in legislating on the issue? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Laura and Khalid, for inviting me and putting this together. It's a pleasure uh, to join this panel. Um, you know, I, I, let me just try to make three points, basically. Um, uh, one is about U.S. interests in the Middle East, um, and to say that there's no question that uh, they have declined in relation to this issue, that the, that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is less of a strategic priority for the U.S. than it was uh, perhaps at any point uh, in the past half a century. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's saying a lot um, because it wasn't always important. It's just, it was, I think that there were a series of things that have diminished uh, America's strategic interest in the region, in part because originally the US saw its interest basically as a commitment to Israel, commitment to oil, uh, during the Cold War, reducing uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, communist influence in the region. Um, and, uh, and the assumption that uh, reconciling America's interest in the Arab world and America's interest in Israel conflicted, and therefore Arab-Israeli peace was an American interest in order to reduce that tension of two important components in American interest. That tension has reduced dramatically starting with the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel that took e Egypt out of the equation, the end of the Cold War that reduced the, the international significance of the region, made the US more influential in the region. Then of course the Iraq war that has reshuffled the deck of the region, the Arab uprisings and the counter to the Arab uprisings, all of which has undou have undoubtedly reduced the strategic importance of this issue. But I wanna make two points about how to look at this. Um, one is uh, in contrast to the Trump administration. So when we say the importance has been reduced, it doesn't mean that it is not still significant. And I'll come back to that at the end. But I think what we should look at is what happened, for example, during the Trump administration, despite the relative decline of this issue strategically in America's interest. Um, the Arab-Israeli issue and the Middle East broadly uh, were a top priority, perhaps even the most important priority in the foreign policy of the Trump administration. It's kind of remarkable to think about it because we kind of like skipped through this to see how it elevated it was in the priorities of the Trump administration. And it wasn't elevated because of its strategic importance. It was elevated for an ex because of an accident of history. We have a president who really wasn't engaged in international affairs who subcontracted this issue uh, to very empowered assistants who had the backing of the presidency, uh, who bypassed um, even consultation with the typical national security agencies of the US uh, to figure out what could be done and use the power of the, uh, the, a superpower, whether it's through incentives uh, and coercion uh, to carry out a vision of their own. Um, that's unprecedented. We haven't seen anything like that in America's history, particularly when there was no imminent uh, crisis. So to, cut, so to, to say that it, it hasn't necessarily, it had declined, that the Israeli-Palestinian issue has declined in strategic importance over the years, it doesn't mean that Americans, governments haven't been involved, and that, that's just a demonstration uh, with the Trump administration. And this is, by the way, an aberration. It's not likely to return. As I called it, it's an accident of history that's not likely to return. So keep that in mind. And part of the problem for the Biden administration, it has to elevate this issue a bit in its priorities in order to address a lot of the what was created under Trump raising it into such a big priority. So there is an American interest and a responsibility 
in a way elevating it, not as much as it was elevated under Trump, but in order to address some of the issues that have conflicted, frankly, with America's interests as they have been defined, uh, including and certainly in, in terms of multilateral organizations, in terms of being in harmony with, with allies, in terms of uh, a previous position taken by the United States, including on things like the Western Sahara, which was just casually traded uh, for, for an agreement without consultation uh, with, uh, with, the, with the main uh, experts on, uh, in, in, the, in the bureaucracy. Um, but I want to end with, with a final point um, related to America's interest and involvement. A lot of people think that, you know, that America's interest has been um, essentially tied to oil, and it has. Of course, oil has been a real issue. Um, and, and later on, obviously, with the fight of militant groups, uh, that, particularly after 9-11 uh, in the Middle East, and that remains. And by the way, despite... Um, uh, the assumption that Obama and Trump were withdrawing from the Middle East, America's footprint in the region, military footprint, remains by far the largest footprint in the region. The U.S. still has major presence in the region and continuing interest regardless that makes it um, harder to, to pull out. But the key cornerstone of America's involvement is the American commitment to Israel. So even if you pull out all the troops, even if you pull out, even cut off... Um, aid to the Arab countries, even if you um, don't have a uh, militant groups challenging the political order and, and, and American interests, um, there is this issue of America's commitment to Israel that has in, in a way implicated the US and made the US a, 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 a part of the conflict. It isn't just a, a sideshow because ultimately when you look um, at the relationship and the American commitment historically to Israel, as it's defined by Congress and as it's defined by American presidents. Uh, it's not so much the economic aid. Um, it is really two features that have not changed at all over the years that still anchor the nature of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that is obviously protecting Israel at the international organizations, the, the employment of the veto power, that have shielded Israel from international resolutions uh, related to Israel-Palestine and, and put us where we are now, where we have such an asymmetry of power um, and a, 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 a situation, a challenge for the US that is, it makes it very hard to deal with. But, but that is in part, in a way, tied to an American responsibility because of that exercise of the American power. And the second uh, is, the assurance of Israel having the technological ed in the military arena. It is the technology of the upper hand where uh, no matter what happens in the Middle East, Israel would have the upper hand militarily. Those two really are the cornerstones of the, the Israeli power. Uh, uh, obviously Israel uh, on its own has built a pretty impressive military and organization but it, the asymmetry that you see between Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and the Arabs that have made it harder for American diplomacy to be effective is tied to that anchoring, uh, anch these anchoring principles. I don't see these changing anytime soon and, and certainly not changing uh, with the Biden administration based on the pronouncements. So that frankly puts a lot of responsibility on uh, the US and Congress to, um, to, to be much more uh, responsible and much more active to bring about an end to the inequity on the ground. I'll just end with that. Uh, thanks, Shibli. I, I wanna um, sort of ask you to zoom out a little bit more. Um, I wanna stay with you for a moment, Shibli, um, because you're also an expert on public opinion, including here in the United States. Um, could you give us a sense of, you know, from, from your polling work and your research, um, you know, where, uh, where the American public stands uh, on this set of issues in Israel and Palestine and where it aligns or doesn't align with where Congress is? Um, and, uh, you know, if there are particular specific areas that you can uh, uh, identify uh, where there is a gap. And also, and I know I'm asking a lot, um, if if you could give us a sense of what accounts for that gap, uh, if in fact there is one. 
Well, sure, um, and you're right. I've been doing, I've been studying this for decades, not years, frankly, and uh, but certainly been highlighting, uh, especially over the last seven, eight years, a growing gap between certain democratic public opinion and democratic elected officials. Uh, by and large, there's not as much of a gap between a Republican uh, uh, public uh, opinion and, and Republicans in Congress, but still there's also a gap. And let me give you an example of a poll I've conducted recently uh, on this issue. Uh, and that is uh, one that relates to a, a perception. So um, if you ask, for example, um, uh, Americans, uh, regardless of their political affiliation, whether they want the U.S. to lean toward Israel, to lean toward the Palestinians, or to lean toward neither side. That's a base question that we have asked uh, historically. And not surprisingly, we see that uh, a majority of Americans want to lean toward neither side, but they're broken by party, where uh, about half of, uh, in some cases, even more than half of, of Republicans say outright they want the U.S. to lean toward Israel. Uh, among Democrats, overwhelmingly, people to want to lean toward neither side. So. We take this then and say um, to, in, in the poll, uh, I can actually read you the, the, um, the poll question, which is uh, compared to, um, uh, compared to, compared with your view on this issue, how would you describe the positions of your elected congressional representatives on it? Meaning, uh, saying leaning more toward Israel, that is more than you are toward Israel, leaning more toward the Palestinians, matching my position, and then refused. And so what we find, interestingly, is a majority say that the, the, the elected officials are leaning more toward Israel than they are. And that 60% say that overall. But interestingly, a majority of every segment, 53% of Republicans, 67% of Democrats, 50, 56% uh, of independents, all of them say uh, a, uh, that the congressional uh, uh, representatives are, are leaning toward Israel more than they are. Um, now, that's also on issues, we, we can measure that. Um, among Democrats, for example, historically, uh, you know, I've asked a question related to what to do about settlements, whether or not they were fine with, uh, doing nothing or doing something more limited or employing sanctions and more. We had a majority of Democrats over almost every poll that we have done over the past few years who supported uh, employing sanctions related to settlement. That's not something that you're gonna get in Congress. Um, we see also uh, you know, on issues related to um, um, uh, laws uh, that punish people for uh, boycotting Israel. Now, obviously, Americans are divided on boycotting, and many of them, uh, uh, regardless of BDS, don't want to boycott. But the question is, on civil liberties, for civil liberties reasons, in, in the strong majority of every uh, segment of the public, including Republicans, don't want to see laws uh, that uh, punish people for boycott. On, on civil rights, for civil rights reasons. That's not the kind of stuff that we see in Congress. So there's a big gap between uh, the public and, and, and Congress. The question is, what accounts for it? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is that obviously this issue is not a priority issue for a lot of people. People have opinions, uh, but the, you know uh, they're gonna vote. You know, we see it's identity politics, it's the economy, it's the pandemic, it's, uh, uh, the threat to democracy, it's other issues of foreign policy. This isn't going to be the issue that is going to determine their vote. So that's why members of Congress don't feel the heat necessarily on this issue. The gap uh, is sustainable. That's typically uh, true on multiple issues, not just the Israeli-Palestinian issue. But second, obviously, it's, you know, politics isn't just about public opinion. It's about fundraising. Uh, it's about lobbying. It's about um, you know, uh, political culture. Uh, it's about elite culture. It's about elite positions. Uh, and so clearly there's a gap here between public opinion and these uh, uh, other dimensions of, pol of policymaking. Thanks, thanks, Shibli. And I want to go to Salem and again talk about perceptions. Shibli was talking about perceptions in Congress and the, the distinction between Congress and, and the American people. I'd be interested about the perceptions from Palestine. 
and how Palestinians perceive Americans and Americans' views towards the conflict and towards Palestinians as people, and how they perceive Congress um, and U.S. policy. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that, and and maybe again, if there's a distinction between the two, what you think that reflects? Sure. Thanks, Laura. So I, I lived in the U.S. for five years. Uh, I lived in the great state of Wisconsin, and then also Washington D.C., uh, working on the Hill. And I've I've cu I've come across two types of, of dominant narratives, or, or one is the uh, lack of understanding of what actually is going on in, in Palestine and Israel, and the, the the other one, which is you know which is uh, more popular, is is one that uh, dehumanizes Palestinians, one that sees us as security threats, one that sees us as violent or backwards, and and seeking the destruction of Israel. And you know, I was I was quite taken back by that when I when I first arrived, but I, I started understanding why. I mean, if you look at the, the media environment in in the U.S., there was a recent study. There are thousands of op-eds written by uh, by uh, different people on on Palestine in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Do you know how many of them were written by Palestinians about Palestinians? One point five percent in the New York Times and one percent. In, in the Washington Post. We've never been able to tell our own story in the US. And so the dominant that has made us uh, or has dehumanized us took hold. And that very much affected the, the policy of, of Congress, uh, but also every US administration uh, to Palestine. And because of the impact of, of the US on our lives, Palestinians are very aware of the rhetoric and the attitudes and the positions that are taken, where we, we follow that very closely. The second is, you know, I'm, I'm a Palestinian millennial. Uh, I'm part of the Oslo generation. Uh, so we grew up uh, as part of the generation that was promised a state. And th those were under the Oslo Accords that were being negotiated by the US. And most of the time we saw the US taking the side of Israel while there were uh, settlements that were being built on our land. And, you know, uh, a prospective Palestinian state today looks like a, an archipelago, you know, a, a, an ocean of Israeli control and, and small Bantustans of Palestinian population centers that are completely disconnected from each other. And it, it really looks like a, a slice of Swiss cheese. So we, we always questioned, we always wondered, why is every U.S. administration backing Israel, even though they purportedly support a two-state solution where the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza would be a future Palestinian state. When the negotiations started, uh, you know, there were uh, 100,000 roughly uh, Israeli settlers, and now there's about you know, 700, 750,000. Um, and so that's, that's what we grew up seeing. And to, to put it into context in Palestinian society, the majority uh, of us are under 30. The average Asian Palestine is 21. We're extremely young society. And this is what we've seen. This is what we've heard from the US for a very long time. And so we don't have a lot of faith and a lot of trust. To give you a quick example, there's a, there's a community in, in, in the Southern West Bank uh, near Hebron that is slated for Israeli demolition because Israel deemed that land to be a military exercise area for it. So basically they rolled in with tanks and armored car, jeeps and, and soldiers terrifying the entire village and, and also slating to, to displace that entire community. The, the Biden administration's reaction to that was both sides need to stop unilateral measures uh, you know, that might impact peace. I mean, wh what, what both sides? You know, one, one community is about to lose their homes and become displaced. And, and so that's the narrative, that's the discourse. So I think, you know, it's, in the U.S. more more than any other place, we we find ourselves fighting back against the, the right just to be human. And it, every piece of law, every piece of policy that comes out doesn't talk about as, as humans seeking freedom, rights, justice, and equality. It's framed within the, the, the context of Israeli security, as if the, the 7 million Palestinians that, that live between the river and the sea don't have the same inherent rights as, as everyone else. So today you have a population of 14 million people that live between in that land, right? And you, your rights are very much tied to your ethno-national identity. If you're Jewish Israeli, you get full spectrum of rights, non-negotiable. If you're Palestinian, you're put into four categories, 
as a Palestinian citizen of Israel, you're unequal by law. There are about 65 laws that, that uh, you know, um, discriminate against you. If you're a Palestinian resident of Jerusalem, you don't have citizenship and you have, uh, you know, you get an, uh, allocated less uh, or resources from the municipality that, than the Jewish Israeli residents of the city, which, caused, uh, which causes a large part of the population there to live under the poverty line. You can lose your home at, at any moment um, through an Israeli demolition order. And, and uh, uh, for me as a Palestinian in the West Bank, you know, we talked about them controlling water. They can come arrest me anytime. I can't even fly from here. I have to go fly from Jordan. Also in terms of, in the context of a pandemic, right? Um, as an occupier, occupying power, Israel has the responsibility to, to provide me with healthcare and, and basic services. And it's being uh, lauded all over the world for its implementation of a vaccine rollout plan. But then there are 5 million Palestinians under its occupation that haven't gotten the vaccine while the settler next door has. So basically you get vaccinated based on your ethno-national identity, not where you live, even if you live in occupied territory. And lastly, it's about who can return and who can visit. You know, I have Palestinian family in Jordan that has never been, right? Palestinians all over the world who are refugees cannot visit their homeland, let alone come live here, but any Jewish person anywhere in the world can. So you have a system of discrimination and inequality and rights based on who you are as a person and a human being. And Israel controls every inch of this land from the river to the sea. And this is the one, one state reality we, we live under. And if you look up that definition under international law, we get, we get the word apartheid. It's a, it's a legal definition. So this is what we're faced with now. And this is what you know, we felt for a long time in Palestine that the US has enabled without holding Israel accountable. And it's not about being pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, it's about being pro-human rights, pro-freedom and pro-progressive values. So that's, <laughs> so that's in a, long, in a long, long winded way, that's how many Palestinians feel about the US and, and the US Congress and US administrations. Thanks, Salem. Um, uh, Zahak, if I could turn to you, uh, in your experience working with Congress members and staff, um, what sorts of misperceptions do you encounter about uh, Israelis, Palestinians, the conflict? Um, and, and if you could also talk a little bit about the gap between measures that Congress takes um, that you know, are arguably well-intentioned, um, things like uh, congressional support for people-to-people -people programs and coexistence, um, ensuring proper oversight for institutions like UNRWA, um, and the reality of, uh, 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 in terms of the impact of those uh, uh, actions that Congress takes. Thanks. Um, there is a lot of understanding, I would say, about the Israeli government's official narrative of, of the situation in Israel-Palestine, um, but very little awareness of the lived experiences that Salem was describing of Palestinians, their history, their indigeneity in the area lying between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, um, where Israel has complete sovereign control and jurisdiction over Palestinians. I remember once um, five years ago going into a meeting with a member of Congress who had never met uh, a Palestinian before. He actually told me and the two others that I was with um, that we looked nothing like what he thought we would look like and we were very articulate. <laughs> Obviously there needs to be more engagement, but you can hardly blame Congress for either looking at Palestinians as the demographic equivalent of a unicorn, particularly given that some current and former members of Congress have claimed we don't exist as a people, or Palestinians are viewed as, viewed as raging terrorists. I mean, that the 1987 law finding the PLO, um, the internationally recognized representative of 13 million people, a terrorist organization is still on the books, really doesn't help to change the perception. So having congressional delegations travel to the occupied uh, Palestinian territories is really critical here. I've organized and led some of those for members and staffers and they are absolutely life changing for those who go. Meeting college students who have to drive two hours around a checkpoint or roadblocks to get to their classroom that should be a 20 minute drive or 
seeing those checkpoints firsthand and the dehumanizing way in which Palestinians who hold green IDs are forced off buses or cars at checkpoints to walk through on foot because they're not allowed to drive through a checkpoint in an Israeli yellow plated car or meeting villagers um, in, in Esawiya or in Nebi Saleh or Khirbat Hamza who face kidnappings, beatings, home demolitions and imprisonment because they simply won't leave their land. That is the stuff you don't see um, on TV or learn in class. Witnessing those things firsthand changes the way you think about everything you ever thought you knew about um, the situation in Palestine. And it isn't a conflict as was said earlier, it's, um, it's between, you know, it's, um, forced population transfer. It's not, you know, two equal sides fighting here. And so that kind of discourse has to change. And it's difficult to do when um, so many members who visit Israel um, regularly um, have never really um, spent much time in the occupied territories. If they do go, they have to go with, you know, armored cars. They go to Ramallah for, you know, a couple of hours. They meet people in the Mulvin Pick Hotel, and then they go back to Jerusalem um, to, to continue with the rest of their trip. So that those things are really important in order to change um, perceptions about the conflict. Um, and you can understand then why there was such an effort to prevent Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib and the other members of Congress from traveling uh, on an unofficial delegation to the occupied territories. There are a growing number of members of Congress I see who really do understand the issues now, particularly in the last four years under Donald Trump with his deal of the century that was really a set of terms for Palestinian submission designed by the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. That so-called peace plan would have essentially given US uh, you know, stamp of approval to apartheid and Israel's annexation of the West Bank and the permanent disenfranchisement of Palestinians. Now, in an effort to try to do something positive to support Palestinians, you do see legislation um, sometimes get passed that looks good on paper, but when implemented actually will entrench the non-static status quo. So uh, for example, we recently saw the passage of legislation to establish an international enterprise fund to support Palestinian economic development and regional cooperation. Well, that sounds great until you realize there aren't any restrictions in the law to prohibit Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank from benefiting from the fund and there are no criteria to ensure that uh, the distinctions will be made between the occupied territories and so that they're not treated as part of Israel. With the UAE-Israel normalization deal, we've seen a lot of follow-on trade and economic agreements that don't respect international law and what it requires with respect to differentiation. The UAE's Abraham Fund will feed into the US Enter Enterprise Fund managed by the International Development Finance Corporation and will you know, move full steam ahead with this regional economic uh, integration without any protections for Palestinian rights as an occupying people or occupied people. Um, now, Congress's treatment of UNRWA is another story. Uh, the organization is purely a humanitarian relief organization, not empowered to work toward a political solution for Palestinian refugees at all. Yet the very existence of the organization is problematic to those who wish to erase Palestinian indigeneity precisely because the organization exists to support Palestinian refugees until a political solution is found to their statelessness. It is the Secretary of State who dispenses aid to UNRWA through accounts held in the State Department, but there are regular bills in Congress to try to call into question UNRWA's work attempt to place greater oversight and restric restrictions on aid going to UNRWA, or that attempt to circumscribe the definition of who may be considered a Palestinian refugee. Now, that definition was set you know, by the United Nations you know, decades ago, but there are, you know, it's, it's extremely problematic for UNRWA to exist in the minds of some people because of the idea of, um, you know, that, that it acknowledges and, and um, uh, establishes that Palestinian displacement occurred in 1948 and the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict is not one that originated in 1967. Thanks, Zaha. And I, I want to stick with you um, and talk a little more about the policy piece of it. So you, we talked about Trump, you talked about Trump during his tenure in office. Now, 
he overturned a lot of long-standing U.S. policies, like moving the embassy, closing the consulate, cutting funding for UNRWA, and and other things happened on his watch, like cutting off aid to the Palestinian people, kicking the PL out of Washington, and and those were actually linked um, to acts of Congress, including the the one that you referenced a couple of times, the 1987 law, um, that you know as much as they were to his policies or, or the objectives of his administration. Can you talk about, though, from where we are today, what has already changed since Biden came in or what is changing and what we can anticipate changing and the challenges or maybe also the opportunities that this will put in front of Congress in dealing with Israel-Palestine? Yeah, a lot is changing in the Biden administration. The problem is that the more you know things change, the more they tend to stay the same. Um, but the things the administration is focused on in the absence of a conducive environment for active peace negotiations are really related to, as you said, restarting aid um, to uh, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, starting bilat restarting bilateral assistance to Palestinians and, and reestablishing diplomatic relations. Only two of those three things can happen with any ease. In the meantime, we can expect settlements to expand in the West Bank and the human rights situation to deteriorate. So on aid to UNRWA, this is the easiest thing to put back online because as I said earlier, UNRWA is funded out of um, the State Department's uh, Migration and Refugee Assistance Account, which is a $3.6 billion account um, that sits there without any ear earmarks for anything except for one thing, which is for resettling Jewish refugees. The last time UNRWA received funding out of the account was in 2017. When the Trump administration stopped UNRWA funding, it reallocated the money to the UNHCR. Now, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has complete discretion to increase UNRWA funding to whatever level he wants. I believe it should be increased given the financial straits UNRWA is in currently uh, attributed to the Trump cutoff, but also because of his Middle East peace team's efforts around the world to try to you know, discredit UNRWA and to have other countries cut off uh, or reduce aid to the agency. There's also, you know, a need around supporting UN UNRWA because it, you know, it's the primary health care giver to, um, you know, Palestinian refugees, 5.7 million Palestinian refugees, and could be a great front line for vaccinating um, the refugee population uh, in all the countries in which UNRWA operates, including Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, as well as the occupied territories. UNRWA also educates, you know, half a million children and will need support getting kids back on track after being out of school because of the pandemic. Um, and it also provides micro lending and loans and um, can assist with the financial recovery after, um, you know, COVID uh, is behind us. Now, on restarting bilateral aid to Palestinians, the Biden administration's efforts will be complicated by a number of pieces of legislation. Um, the most important of these uh, federal laws is um, the Taylor Force Act that was passed in 2018, which cut off virtually all aid to Palestinians, so long as Palestinians provide social welfare payments and benefits to Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails and the families of those killed in political violence against Israel. Now, the Taylor Force Act assumes that Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation is incentivized by social welfare payments. This causal connection has not been proven, however, and what is not dealt with under the Taylor Force Act are the ways um, to end the underlying violence in the occupied territories that precipitates resistance, which is the occupation itself. Uh, over a half century old now. And um, this is what's producing, you know, the home demolitions, the evictions, things that Salem talked about, extrajudicial ju killings and the colonization. And it's that's what's creating the dependency. Now, um, Shibley wrote a great piece. I want to flag for people. I hope it's in the chat box already. Uh, Laura, you can tell us about the, um, the Taylor Force Act and the um, Palestinian uh, prisoner payments. Now, despite this, the Palestinian Authority and the PLO are attempting to reform the social welfare system. However, the Taylor Force Act requires that the, that the payments be purely need-based rather than ones based on one's status. 
A needs-based system will be difficult for the PA to establish given the large extent of Palestinian need and destitution itself caused by the movement and access restrictions imposed on Palestinians and the restrictions on Palestinian trade and economic activity. Um, there are also other recurring prohibitions and, and appropriations legislation that affects bilateral aid to Palestinians. This includes um, cutting off aid to the PA should Hamas be part of a PA government or exerts undue influence over a government. Now with Palestinian elections coming up in May, Hamas could very well become part of the government. To get around this, the Palestinian Anti-Terrorism Act of 2006 would require Hamas to recognize the Jewish state of Israel's right to exist. I think that is going to be unlikely for Hamas to do, especially since not even the ruling party Fatah or President Mahmoud Abbas are willing to recognize Israel as an ethno-religious state, which would deny Palestinian indigeneity again and um, what became the state of Israel and undermine Palestinian legal claims to reparations for their forced displacement in 1948. Another law I want to flag that would hamper a restart of bilateral assistance is one in uh, recurring appropriations bills concerning cutting off aid if Palestinians seek accountability for Israeli war crimes at the International Criminal Court. Palestinians have already submitted a referral to the ICC against Israeli officials for the Gaza bombardment in 2014, Israel settlement enterprise and the treatment of Palestinian prisoners. And there is no waiver under the legislation. Presumably, Palestinians would have to withdraw their referral and stop cooperating with the investigation by the ICC prosecutor. I don't know, um, you know that that's going to happen. Um, I don't even know if that's really, uh, you know, if, that's, if that would stop the law from, uh, you know, if that would reverse uh, the applicability of the law because the cat's out of the bag at this point on the ICC. Um, on restarting bilateral relations with Palestinians, um, the Biden administration will have to find a way around the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act and its amendments, which provides that if the PLO or PA opens an office in the US or has any official presence, this will trigger over $650 million in damage claims that have been previously dismissed. The PLO and the PA will not open an office in the US so long as there's this threat of damages hanging over their heads for doing so. So if the Biden administration wants to reestablish bilateral relations, it might have to stick to Zoom. <laughs> of course, Congress could amend the legislation, but I don't think it would be uh, politically you know, feasible to revise the law to deny victims legal redress, particularly at this time when the administration wants to be selective about what battlefronts they open up with Israel as they seek to bring the Iran nuclear deal back online. Thanks, uh, thanks Zaha. Um, I want to uh, pick up on a point that you raised about the Taylor Force Act. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, Shibley uh, wrote this uh, uh, excellent piece on that subject. Um, Shibley, could you talk to us a little bit about um, what motivated you to write that piece? Um, as, as we heard from, uh, from Zaha, this is a law uh, that was uh, that's uh, been around for a couple of years that um, uh, bars aid to uh, that benefits the PA so long as the PA or the PLO provides these welfare payments to Palestinians who've been imprisoned or killed by uh, by Israel. Um, can you talk about why you think that law and the way it's framed, it's been referred to as the Pay for Slay Act, um, why those are problematic? Sure, thanks. Um, so first of all, I mean, you know, Zaha did a, a really nice job summarizing some of the implications. Uh, and it's really important to keep in mind, obviously, um, you know, if uh, the Biden administration is going to try to start a new kind of relationship with Israel and the Palestinians to push forward uh, some path toward uh, peace, um, uh, it, it has to abide by laws. And this is uh, the Taylor Force Act is clearly one of those laws that they're going to have to deal with. And we see even the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is beginning to have a dialogue or wants to have a dialogue with the Biden administration on this issue to figure out how to address it or get around it. But what motivated me was something bigger than that, because it, was, it wasn't just the law, which obviously is important, and, and you know, members of Congress and staffers should be aware to how these seemingly 
um, the, sometimes laws that are passed casually uh, that have such confining implications, uh, including for the pursuit of, of the very American interests that an administration wants to do. It should make people think. But it's more than that, that the discourse itself uh, focused on this issue as if it were the big obstacle to the path of peace, that is the issue of payment to Palestinian prisoners. It's been distorted in a way, in a big way, and not fully understood. And I think that label that you mentioned, uh, pay uh, to slay, is itself not only distorting, uh, but really insidiary. And, and therefore, I, I thought that it should be, there should be some kind of correction of the discourse to understand the context in which this takes place. It's, it's distorting and insidiary to start with uh, because obviously it Im implies just the way it's formulated that the PA is paying people in order to kill Israelis and that the Palestinians who carry out, out attacks are doing it because they're getting paid. Neither of which is true. For one thing, whatever you say about the PA and there are many that we all can level against the PM. People do legitimately against it, whether it's uh, you know uh, practices, whether it's uh, um, uh, its way of governing, whether it's uh, inability to come up with creative ideas, whether it's representation of the Palestinians. All these questions can are legitimate, um, but whatever you say about it, it certainly has not been advocating violence with the Israelis. On the contrary, the PA forces. Um, uh, cooperation with Israeli security forces has been universally understood to be critical for Israeli security. Uh, and Abbas himself, whatever you say about him, has not been one who has endorsed, uh, you know, attacks against Israelis. And for one, in, in, in addition to that, of course, that cooperation with Israeli forces has come under criticism by the Palestinians who uh, criticized the PA for not being able to defend them against settler violence and, and soldier violence. So uh, for one thing, that, that formulation about the, the intent of the, uh, of the system is completely, of course, erroneous. And second, from the point of view of the Palestinians, it's really ridiculous to say that uh, uh, whatever happens in, in terms of violence that occurs is not principally connected to occupation but, but connected to payment. For one thing, one of the things that the American discourse does not address in terms of incentives uh, and counter incentives uh, for carrying out violence is that uh, the, Israel has collective punishment policy, which really violates the Geneva Convention and has been criticized by human rights groups, whereby a, a um, would-be perpetrator, an attacker, uh, would be not only punished directly, but, but their family would be punished, uh, including demolition of homes, which again, you know, in and of itself shouldn't take place, whether it's, you know, uh, against Israelis who commit violence or Palestinians who commit violence. So um, that disincentive, that is that you, you to think that a, a Palestinian uh, who are, uh, will be unlike other human beings, in terms of thinking not only about the consequences for them of being in jail or killed, but the emotional consequences for their family of their, them being killed or jailed. Uh, and on top of it, knowing that their families could be, become homeless in, a, in, a, in an already miserable uh, situation of occupation uh, in order to get some payment uh, for them down the road is just not the way the calculus works. It's not to say that that there's no, you know, that those things don't factor in, you know, what, whether their families are protected up to a point or whether Israel is going to punish them up to a point. These factor in, but that's not the incentive. For example, think about the whole duration of the occupation when these practices are in place. There have been ups and downs in, 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 in violence that were not a function of whether there is payment or not to Palestinians or, or for that matter, uh, punishment by the Israelis. So it's just completely conceptually wrong. But more than that, one of the things that is not clear, you know, that, that to, to people is that while, of course, prisoners include people who have committed uh, terrorism by the by the independent definition of international organization, human rights organization, that is, uh, attack civilian targets. 
many of them are not guilty of that or even have not been charged with that. And when you look at why this issue is popular among Palestinians, that is the payment to prisoners, it's universally, look at the polls, overwhelmingly, the vast, almost all Palestinians support the system. And they support it not only because of what I said, but also uh, because almost a million Palestinians, by some estimates, have already been uh, you know, uh, arrested or imprisoned by Israeli forces out of a population of 5 million, meaning every single, you know, family has had some connection uh, to, to a prisoner or somebody who is, who is held by the Israelis. And there is no protection for the Palestinians themselves, right? So, uh, so if you're, uh, if, if a, um, the vast majority of cases where you have settlers kill Palestinians, or Israeli soldiers kill Palestinians, are not uh, ended in any convictions uh, uh, in any case. And obviously, uh, there is no protection for the Palestinians against violence from settlers and Israelis. And there is the asymmetry of, uh, of, of justice, where a Palestinian is obviously uh, 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 has to go to a military court versus a settler who might kill a Palestinian um, has to um, uh, you know, it goes to a civilian, a civil court, and, and most of the time, uh, uh, the, the, you know, they're not uh, uh, convicted. Uh, so I think those are the kind of issues that are missed in this labeling uh, that, that distorts. Uh, it is something uh, clearly not at the core of why there is no peace between Israel and the Palestinians. It is a symptom. It's not a cause. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the cause, obviously, of what we see is, um, you know, over 50 years of occupation with no end in sight, hopelessness um, uh, uh, across the board. Uh, and um, I think it would be wrong to elevate this issue into a central issue in our discourse. It wouldn't do any service uh, to the cause of peace in the region. Thank you, Shibli. I want to go over back to Salem. So Salem, I want to put a hot topic in front of you. It's a hot topic for a lot of us, um, which is the issue of anti-Semitism and the way that the issue of anti-Semitism is being tied to a uh, debate around Israel and specifically being tied to what I, I would argue is the very narrative of being Palestinian, the Palestinian history, the Palestinian reality, lived reality. And we're seeing this in Congress. In the past few Congresses, there's been legislation introduced. There was the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. We're seeing pressure around adoption of this IRA, IHRA definition and Facebook and people can Google and see lots of articles about this. What I wanted to ask you to talk about is how this is perceived from the Palestinian side as Palestinians when you see members of Congress really debating or weighing in on whether or not you're even allowed to be Palestinian or whether in a sense it is anti-Semitic to assert your Palestinian-ness and your rights as Palestinians. Thanks, Lara. This is a hot topic and one that we deal with almost on a daily basis. You know, imagine, imagine, you know, as, as a human being, you're denied the right to define your reality, uh, talk about it and criticize it. Just for, for defining the, the form of oppression I live under every day, there are constant smears, attacks, uh, forms of de delegitimization that, that go on. There was a question earlier in the chat about forms of, uh, of restrictions on freedom of speech. I mean, this, this one is, is the, the dominant one that we, that we, that we have to face. And this, this uh, feeling of, or phenomenon of shrinking space that, that really affects us physically in Palestine, being surrounded by settlements, soldiers, occupation and apartheid, but also the right to, to talk about it and advocate for it. Um, you know, the, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, based in Jerusalem has poured in millions and millions of dollars on campaigns that are aimed at delegitimizing Palestinians and also are pursuing the laws all over the world, not just in the US. They try to uh, conflate criticism of Israel, Palestinian advocacy, Palestinianness with with anti-Semitism. There was an event in Germany recently that wanted to, to associate the word Palestine with anti-Semitism. That's where we've reached. And so now 
there's a huge fear of, of speaking out, of criticizing, uh, of being an activist, um, because it has serious impacts on, on, on who you are, on your livelihood, on your job, on your family. And we've seen this, uh, this weaponization of a, a serious form of hate and racism being targeted against members of Congress and elected officials who also want to stand with Palestine. This is something we've been dealing with for a long time, and now it's being exported to other places around the world. And this is, you know, it's a serious allegation. Now, the rise of anti-Semitism is also a real thing. It's a, it's a real phenomenon, right? And it's, it's terrible, it's horrible. We want to fight against it in all forms of racism and hate. But at the same time, you cannot take away our right to, to criticize a government uh, and a regime that is responsible for our oppression and daily injustices, right? And by also associating with Palestine and not looking at the real triggers and fuels of this rise of anti-Semitism, which is the far right, which accounts for the majority, if not the most of the cases of anti-Semitism and violent anti-Semitism around the world, you also diminish from, from fighting against it. And this is a real problem that we're dealing with. And the IRA definition now is, is also being adopted by, as you, it's being considered by Facebook, it's being considered by many legislators around the world, etc. cetera. You, you can be an anti-Semitic just for criticizing Israel. That's where, that's where we're, we've gotten to. So this, this idea of shrinking space, the, the um, crushing of our, our right to, to uh, free speech uh, is happening at home and abroad. And it's, it's, it's crazy to me, in all seriousness, that a Congress halfway across the world can legislate that, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's seriously alarming. And so if, if my right of being Palestinian is taken away, what, what more do I have left? Thanks, Salem. Um, we, have, <clears throat> we have just a, a few minutes uh, left, about uh, nine minutes or so. And so I want to put one final round of questions uh, to, uh, to each of you. Um, uh, starting with, uh, with you, Salem. Uh, a few years ago, Aaron Miller, who is a, a longtime American diplomat and negotiator, talked about the imperative of the US adopting a policy, first and foremost, <clears throat> of doing no harm when it came to Israel and Palestine. Um, from your perspective, um, what would an approach like that look like from the standpoint of the US Congress? And I wanna ask each of you uh, to, uh, to respond to that question in two minutes or less, starting with uh, Salem. I, I accept the challenge, Khalid. Um, for me, it's, it comes down to no justice, no peace, very simply. It's, it's, it's a dominant uh, part of the understanding of, of what it means to be oppressed in the US and it's very dominant part of what it means to be oppressed in Palestine. And justice to me means accountability. And the, the two examples I gave at the beginning was US is giving Israel 3.8 billion in military funding that goes towards my oppression. And it also allows for the annexation and colonization of our land and this idea of a Palestine, Palestinian state to, to no longer be feasible. Um, there, these are the points where I think we can see more justice from the US through more accountability um, and, and, and trying to build an environment that is more conducive for freedom, justice, equality, and rights for all, right? It shouldn't matter who you are, where you're from. These, these are inherent human rights that should be afforded to all. So that's a, that's a minimal requirement, I think, and ask from, from, from Congress. Uh, Zaha. Thanks. Um, yeah, do no harm. Do no harm to me means, you know, taking your thumb off the scales. And, you know, we talked about sort of the anti-Semitism definition. That's an attempt to really, um, you know, put the thumb on the scale of what's okay to say about the Israel-Palestine conflict. It has real world ramifications. I mean, right now we're seeing Facebook um, you know, thinking about um, including the word Zionist as sort of a proxy um, use for um, Jewish and, and sort of banning that and, you know, taking down posts uh, around that. 
in, you know, my daughter just had a post up where she was responding to someone else's post that said that, you know, Palestinians aren't a people. And my daughter's response was, you know, Palestinians are the indigenous people of the land. And her post was taken down <laughs> off of the platform, not the post that said Palestinians aren't a people. And, you know, it's funny because she didn't even say Palestinians, uh, Palestinian Muslims and Christians are the indigenous people. She said Palestinians, which includes Jewish people. <laughs> so um, this is a really, this is a really um, uh, problematic thing that we're seeing. And, you know, the U.S. government by now adopting the IRA definition is making this, um, making it much more difficult to have, you know, meaningful discourse around Israel-Palestine. Um, the other the other area that the U.S. could you know do no harm would be to take its thumb off the scales of you know international accountability for Israel. Like it's no longer provide you know um, Israel protection and international fora to prevent um, accountability. Uh, you know we we've seen this uh, Biden administration say um, that it is going to rejoin international organizations just for the purpose of um, you know making sure that they aren't biased against Israel. And, and unfortunately, bias against Israel has meant Palestinians being able to access um, those um, mechanisms for accountability and to end impunity. So it's, for me, that would that's what do no harm means. Um, Shibli. Well, you know, Trumpism, I think, has been clarifying for many of us. Um, it's been clarifying because um, it, it basically um, uh, told us that we can't be complicit. Um, it told us that we can't take democracy, freedom, and human rights for granted, that we have to be proactive, that those are very important to even defining who we are and what we are and the way we live our lives. And what we have seen as those issues are interconnected at home and abroad, uh, what you do at home affects what you do abroad and what you do abroad affects what you do at home. Uh, we're in the middle of a values war, essentially, in America, an identity war. And I think most Americans have spoken, and most Americans have spoken in, in, in polling, that they embrace equality, democracy, uh, uh, freedom, human rights. Uh, and I think in that sense, uh, this should also inform us about what to do on this issue. Uh, because what we have seen, what I've said before, about our involvement uh in we, we're we're we are not just an observer of what's happening in israel palestine we are intricately involved we are part of the structure of the relationship between israel and the palestinians because of the backing that we pro have provided and continue to provide and with that comes a responsibility that is very much linked to who we are and you look at the uh polling on this about what kind of outcome Americans would like to see, particularly if there's no two states. And it is one that very much falls on issues of values like democracy, human rights, and freedom. And I think we all need to keep that in mind. And I think Congress needs to keep that in mind. Thank you. I think that last round was a really good place to end the con the, this conversation. And we're, we're running out of time. I want to be respectful of all of our uh, attendees' time. On behalf of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and the Middle East Institute, I want to thank our participants, Salem, Zaha, and Shibli. And thanks to everyone who joined us for this webinar. We hope you enjoyed today's session. And we hope you enjoyed it so much that you come back next Friday at the same time for the next session in our teach-in, which will be entitled Human Rights, Occupation, and Democracy. And that will feature Isa Amro coming to us from Hebron, Hagai al Ad coming to us from Jerusalem, and Nora Erika from Rutgers. And please do share the invitation with your colleagues on the Hill. Um, and if you missed anything that text box in the, that was in the chat box and you want to find any of those resources, we will list that on the Foundation for Middle East Peace resource page where you signed up for this in the first place. And with that, we will end for today. So thank you and enjoy your weekends, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.